Um, that movie was inspiring in so many ways, um, but one is just what a civic hero she is um, in terms of her stability with other justices um, who have different ideas than she has. Also, just how to engage with the system to make it even better within that system. I think that was incredible. So, um, I'd like to really quickly introduce um, uh, Lita Plunkett and Julie Collin. Um, I'm honored that I get to call them both friends, and it's really wonderful to have them both in the same room. Yeah, and Julie are going to talk about 15 minutes, and then we're going to open up for some questions. Um, Leah Plunkett is a faculty member and an associate dean at, at University of New Hampshire School of Law and a fellow at the Burke McLean Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. At the law school, Leah teaches access to justice course, an access to justice course. Harvard's work and Klein, she researches and writes about young people's digital lives, student privacy, digital citizenship, and educational equity. Professor Plunkett was the founder of the Youth Law Project at the New Hampshire, Le at New Hampshire Legal Assistance, and she's a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School. Ms. Collins. <laughs> is the co-creator, along with Betsy West, of what you just saw, which really speaks for itself, and means that... Hello? I think the... Hello? That the introduction at this point is... <laughs> seems silly because it's so magnificent what you just saw, but... Um, it was featured at Sundance this year and was purchased by Magnolia Pictures. Before this, um, where Julie directed, produced eight documentary features on topics varying from South African opera singers to disabled veterans to a legendary smoked fish store on the Lower East Side. Her films have aired on PBS and have been picked up for digital distribution. She's won three New York Emmy Awards since 2012. Previously, she was producer at NBC News and creator of Court TV Supreme Court Watch. She graduated from Collier and holds a master's degree from Columbia Journalism School and Yale Law School. So please join me along with them. would love to hear, Julie, how did you get to go from not yet to <laughs> making this fantastic film? Uh, yeah, it was a, a long journey, but the, you know, the short story was kind of basically not really giving up. Um, as I said before, like she hadn't quite said no, so we kind of regrouped and went back to the justice a few months later in the summer of 2015 saying like, you know, you don't need to talk and sit down and do an interview with us right now, but we'd love to get a go ahead from you to sort of start working on a story about your life. Basically, here's a list of people that we were thinking that we might want to interview. Just, we were really just trying to give her a sense that we were taking things seriously and we're just going to do something about, you know, the internet memes and the tattoos and stuff. And uh, we, um, and we knew that like she's the, a person of her stature, like anyone from her life that you try to interview is going to immediately turn around and say like, well, well did, you know, go to her and say, is it okay with you? So we wanted to basically get her, her blessing without us having to do interview. We got um, a response from her again right away where she said, I won't be ready to talk to you for at least another two years. But um, if you're going to start interviewing people, here are three people who weren't on your list that I think you might want to talk to. Um, so again, it was like, okay, that's a weird yes, but it still seemed kind of like a yes. 
And at that point was when we went to figure out how we could raise some money to start shooting a film in which the main character hadn't agreed to talk to us. Was, was both, I should add, was 83 years old and said, had said like two years was the soonest we could possibly talk to her. Um, uh, amazingly, uh, CNN Films took a big leap of faith in giving us sort of a little bit of preliminary funding to start filming some interviews because we just knew that like pushing her for more access wasn't the thing to do at that point. What we needed to do was like start our project um, and they gave us a little bit of funding, ended up actually funding uh, the full thing and we started doing interviews and we just got the access kind of uh, li little by little. Um, and the sit-down interview and the showing her footage and the in her home and with her granddaughter and working out with her trainer, Brian Johnson, all happened at the very end. We actually already had a rough cut of all the history stuff before. And so by the time that we were going to interview her and do that, we kind of knew what we, what we needed. So actually her whole time frame ended up being like this great documentary production strategy on her part, although I'm sure that's not what she had in mind. So what was it like to get to know her? That seems like it must be mind-blowing. Yeah, you know, it was amazing spending time with her, especially during a time when she was getting so much public attention and love, as you saw in the movie. She's a really reserved person. If you ask her, and just like her childhood friend says, but said, like small talk is not what she does. If you ask her how are you, she'll pause for like 15 seconds and come up with like a really reasoned answer, and which often comes out in a full, you know, not just paragraph, but sometimes a whole essay form. Like almost everything she says has a beginning, middle, and end, and is, is really is well thought out. But that said, there are these little moments. I mean, she, you know. If she thinks something, I think the reason that her kids bothered to make a book that said mommy laughed was not only that she laughed so rarely, but when you make her laugh, like it feels really, really good. She's got a great laugh, so we sort of would come up with ways to try to amuse her or please her. If you say something that she's not interested in, she does not pretend to be interested. So you really need to either engage her, which is kind of easy once you get, you know, you could, uh, talking about the law, if you get into the nitty gritty, talking about a case, she loves to do that, but that's intimidating because like you're going to say something wrong and she knows, she knows the stuff, so sort of afraid to do that. But anything having to do with opera or really any of the arts, she really likes art and my, I had mentioned I had interviewed her before, that was for a film that I made about a Lower East Side smoked fish store called The Sturgeon Queens, so a, a store which she's a big fan of. And for that interview, I had actually brought, this is sort of a long, weird story, but I had brought like pickled herring to her at the US Supreme Court. And so when things weren't going that well, when, like, they, when I was trying to break the ice again, I mean, I remember that time when I brought like the whitefish and the pickled herring into the court, and then like her face would light up. So, um, you know, you can find the th things that are, uh, you know, and, and seeing like what she was wearing every time was always great, as you saw in the movie. Her, clothes are just like amazing, her accessories, her little shoes, <laughs> so, um, you know, so it was pretty cool spending, spending time with her. Um, what, what would you say was the most difficult thing to either talk to her or talk to the people in her life about? One of the many wonderful things about this film is that it is deeply honest and comprehensive. You know, and she clearly comes across as a deeply optimistic human being, which is inspiring, but there are things in there that are kind of tough. What was, what was the toughest from an interviewer perspective? Yeah, I mean, it's hard. Um, you know, we were, anything that feels personal, not happy was a little bit difficult. Um, you know, talking about um, her, her mom, um, but, you know, the Trump thing was, was tricky because that was obviously a very sensitive uh, situation, but we had to, um, you know, we had to raise it and actually she ended up having something that I thought was helpful and useful um, to say that she hadn't really said before on the question that, um, you know, not only the uh, law professor from um, Scalia Law School at George Mason, but actually a, a I think dozens of members of Congress had 
signed a petition that's making the same point that, oh, she has to recuse herself for all administration-related things, and she hadn't really answered previously. She had answered what she was, that she wasn't going to say much more about Trump, but actually I actually thought she actually had, a, had quite a good answer. Um, so we were glad that we were able to, to raise that with her. It felt, it felt awkward to ask. It, it seems from watching the film that she has an amazing sense of empathy for an identification with the people she represented as an attorney. Did you get the sense that she really remembers them and the details of their lives? Um, yeah, we know she does because being in their homes, um, each of them pulled out. I mean, the great thing is when Ruth Bader Ginsburg like sends you a card, you tend to save it, like certainly <laughs> once she became a Supreme Court Justice, but everyone, you know, from pretty early on in her life had the sense that this was someone <laughs> major. So um, Sharon Frontiero and Stephen Weisenfeld and Lily Ledbetter, um, you know, people who had had, a, a, had direct, you know, whose lives were impacted by her work or who, who were uh, represented by her have like boxes in their closets that are just, I mean, Stephen Weisenfeld's case, he, he brought out like scrapbooks full of just every note that she had sent him, and she had sent him many. I mean, they, they became friends, but even Sharon Frontiero, you know, she always sent her uh, birthday cards, and when things were going on with family, she's just very thoughtful about that, and, and I can like attest to that myself. Like, she sent me two separate notes about the smoked fish that I brought her. Um, so, like, she, she writes, you know, handwritten, uh, handwritten notes and, and really keeps in touch with people. I mean, in some ways it runs counter to this reserved person that is her image, like people that she, and, you know, and her childhood friends, one of whom lives in uh, Bethesda, Maryland, you know, near near DC said that she's, you know, justice knows, 